Um, yeah, congratulations man. on the new record too, man. Um, yeah. Calm down, Cologne. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Man, you don't want that stuff sprayed on you. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Now th no. that's 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 uh that's the terminology for mace, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's how it was. Uh, that's how it was told to me. Oh my god, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, there's a a, a lot of uh, scattered uh, crazy people around these days, man. So um, we, we, oh, we yeah. don't need the mace, but uh, we need some kind of some kind of calm down. <laughs> well, you know, that's how Charlie and Stanton. That's how they play together too. It's like it's like being maced. Look out! <laughs> it's like bang, what? Gives you that mace face. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed, man. Dude, man, no, it sounds like a like a party, man. But man, you, it, this is a crazy question I'm going to start out with. There's mm -hmm. this cat that's kind of, I would say, a lesser known name, obscure to many people in the Seattle area back in the day. His name was Hadley Callaman. Oh, yeah, man. I used to take lessons from Hadley. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> oh, crazy, man. Dude, tell me cat. about that, man. Man, have you ever seen, there's some YouTubes, too, of him playing with Freddie Hubbard in Rome. Yes. Yes. Oh my lord. Yes. I mean, it's like one, two, oh, one, two, three, four. Didn't even, didn't even be just like the most serious hard bop stuff you ever heard, man. Uh huh. Just cooking, man. Oh my lord. Who's on that? Lewis Nash and stuff. I, I don't. I can't remember. Yeah, that. yeah. I, I don't remember the band either. But that's how I found out about him. And I'm and I did a little research. I was like, man, this cat was from. Or lived in Seattle for years. I was like, yeah. man, I wonder did did, did Scarrick know him when when he was coming up? That's really cool. You know, my friends knew him a lot better. They hung out with him. Mm -hmm. They played with him. I was, you know, more of a student that had a, a, a more limited relationship with the school that he was teaching at. Okay. But mm -hmm. at on um, the there was a sign up day at Cornish. You go in and you sign up for classes. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> he he walked in and there, you know, there's a bunch of students in there and there's small rooms uh -huh. and, and there's a bunch of teachers and and Hadley had a stack of records in his arm, right? Vinyl records. This was in, you know, this is in um, 83 or 1984 or something. Yeah. And he's like, and he's looking for the kid for the kids who had saxophone cases, you know. And he saw I you know, he saw a case. He's like, you, hey, you. You need lessons, you know. I played on all these records. I played on all these records, you know. And he's like, yeah. And I was just, it was like, I yeah. was like, whoa, like you know, uh -huh. I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. And um, mm -hmm. I'm so glad I got to know him mm -hmm. because um, he was a great teacher, mm -hmm. and I really mm -hmm. had some great one-on-one -on -one lessons with him, and mm -hmm. super mm -hmm. thankful about that. He taught me how to practice quietly like when you're huh. living in an apartment or something like that yeah yeah because i was about to move to paris france okay okay and so and he's like okay he's like this is what you do and he had that he already had this whole method like I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of those cats did back then you know mm -hmm. because they were living in tight quarters in new york and mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. big city you know they he just had this whole methodology for practicing saxophone quiet is fantastic man it was so cool wow, wow. yeah that's and he was also he was also a big proponent of uh everything c major scale <laughs> everything c major scale everything c major. <laughs> <laughs> you know so that was fun you know yeah to like he could simplify music harmony and break mm -hmm. things down you know which was good for me you know yeah man that's cool. That's cool. I mean, everybody yeah. talks about Seattle in, in the 90s, but I don't hear about Seattle much in the 80s, man. What was it like, man? How did you start playing and what scene did you encounter, man, when you were when you were just starting out? Well, you know, I wasn't, you know, I grew up mostly listening to rock music and playing symphonic music in school orchestra and symphony. And then, but my dad was huge jazz fan. Mm, okay. Okay, so he was constantly taking anytime Count Basie came to town or, you know, um, Maynard Ferguson or Buddy Rich or, 
Yeah. There was a lot of touring yeah. big bands back then. Mm -hmm. And he would take me to every single show and any cool. jazz festival or music festival in town where we were outside, you know, he was just, just constantly you know, mm -hmm. go here, let's go there. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't go see a lot of the, um, the club stuff. Cause I was all 21 and up. Mm -hmm. But when I was in high school, I would stand outside. I found certain clubs and I would go stand outside in the alleys, you know, and I met uh, Dizzy Gillespie that way. Ah. Was I was in the alley of uh, Parnell's, this this club in Seattle that we all everyone played at. And mm. he saw us standing back there as me and this buddy of mine, and, you know, and, and he was just like looking at us like, what are you guys doing back here? <laughs> That's he something. just was, he just couldn't understand like what he's like, man, you know, they, so people sometimes are really nice and they would leave the door cracked. Mm -hmm. like there's, mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I was hungry. I was a music fiend, man. I was like, you know, I had ticket stubs all over my wall. I was trying to go see everything everywhere yeah. all the time. That's awesome. That's so awesome. in the eighties, I, I don't really, there wasn't too many things I could go check out, but I was lucky to um, meet this local guitarist, Leif Todasek, mm -hmm. and his one of his main focuses was uh, uh, Sukus music, Congolese music. Mm. Um, yeah, from Africa. So um, a lot of stuff from Tanzania and um, Kenya, and mostly like Zaire. So at the time. So, wow, that was like, you know, I had never heard anything like that before. And so all of a sudden I'm learning all this music, you know, all the six over four, four over six, you know, six, eight stuff, you know, bang, bang, bang. you know, and everything's in E major, uh -huh. <laughs> which, you know, for that's F, you know, F sharp major for, B flat tenor sax man so it was like six sharp man i got really good at six and seven sharps man you know <laughs> that's great Nineteen thousand sharps so yeah. it, that was crazy being thrown into that whole world and then so i later on i moved to london and played with him there we i only played in african groups the whole time i was there wow it was wow. really a, a good experience man so in the 80s, you know, there was a lot of blues in Seattle, huge blues scene, all these clubs, a lot of blues. And mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes you could get gigs playing in that and and then checking, you know, a lot, not a lot of groups would tour Seattle because mm -hmm. geographically, you know, you're just way up in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I never had money to go to concerts really after, you know, high school. So it was hard, you know, to, to see stuff, you know, you just didn't really see a lot of stuff, man. I would go to the magazine store and see like, they had two week old village voice, you know, yeah. paper. Yeah. And I would look in the back at the club listings and just be like, wow, I got to go to New York. I got to get to New York. That's real. You know, and I was, the, the issues were old, you know, cause they had to mail them out. And I was just, man, I would just dream about it, man. You know, so the first time I went there to New York, I just wa I would walk every day, like from Central Park all the way down, you know, to um, Soho, you know, and, and just try and get into any club I could, you know. Man, I remember seeing Jimmy Smith playing with his trio at Blue Note. Yeah. And Cecil Taylor's birthday and Cecil was in the audience. That's real. And Jimmy real. like gave him a shout out and he goes, I'm dedicating this to Cecil. And he played this one song. It must have been 15 or 30 minutes long. It was completely out. I believe and, it. But the rhythm section was just holding it Still down. Still swinging. That's crazy. Yeah, man. they were just like, you know, just doing it. And he was just like, oh, just, yeah. he it was, it was like, I'm telling you right now, if that was recorded, it it would be a record that everyone would be talking mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. arguing about. 
Yeah, yeah. Man, he he was just like A to Z on the organ, man. I haven't heard any organ player play any more than he had. And he had all the styles in him, you know. What do you want? I I, I was Larry Young yeah. before Larry Young. You know, I was, you know, Joey D before yep. Joey D, you know, like mm -hmm. he was the complete cat. That's that's crazy, man. And he was one, it's funny you mentioned him. I was a little kid, maybe six or seven, when I heard Midnight Special. And it just messed me up, man. That that <laughs> blue nose. It just messed me all the way up. Cause I was familiar with like Hammond more towards like uh, church, but like yeah. I didn't know what it was like in the context of blues and swinging and something in him just really created this this fire and mm -hmm. this hunger in me. Um and, and it's crazy. I'm from Nashville, I lived there most of my life. And he lived there for like two years in the 80s, but I was too young. Oh, so really? Have, yeah, I wouldn't have been able. I've heard a lot of wild stories from some of the old timers there about about <laughs> him and, and, and what he liked. But um, yeah, man, it's crazy <laughs> that you that, that, that you say that, because that's one of the things it's like, man, Jimmy was so, so complete, man. And, and I feel like to kind of bring this back around, like. I first heard you when I was maybe 20, 21, when I first started going out, you were in this band called uh, Prescription Renewal with uh, Mike Clark. And, yeah, uh, Charlie too. Yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right. And and I was like, man, it, it, this guy, is, is he coming out of like a rock thing? Is he coming out of like an Eddie Harris thing? It sounds like all of them and I love it. it it's, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Yeah, I had never seen anybody live at least at that point um, marry the saxophone with the electronics. That was my first live encounter with mm. that. And now that you say rock and roll, like that makes a lot of sense. Were you trying originally when you when you developed that to keep up with the guitar players or what were you hearing that led you into electronics? Yeah, I had, I was uh, an early band like in 1989 or 90. Mm. I started playing with this group, this duo called Sad Happy. Mm. And it was this incredible bass player. He could play Bach violin concertos on okay. a P bass, you know, on four string electric bassing. He could do, I mean, he was absolutely incredible, brilliant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I was just messing around with those guys. I wasn't trying to join the band or something. I just accidentally became part of the band. <laughs> and then, you know, like two records later, you know, I remember he, the bass player looking over, he was like, hey man, I guess you're in the band now. <laughs> That's you know, cool. but but when I started rehearsing with those guys, they were so powerful and so mm. and so um, dynamic. And you know, the acoustic saxophone, it was just it was too. It wasn't enough, you know. Okay. It, it, I needed more different textures and timbres, mm. you know. So I started experimenting with that stuff and man, that was a big learning curve because there wasn't things made mm, mm. to get a microphone signal into guitar effects. There was nothing made, you know, for that at the time. Mm. So, you know, it was a lot of experimenting and trying to make things fit. I mean, a lot of impedance problems and okay. you know, a lot of unity gain problems. So, you know, but I had, I was lucky because there were some people that really helped me, like James Reynolds, this amazing producer and engineer. Mm -hmm. And um, he took the time to, you know, show me how to do stuff and guided me towards uh, certain things to use. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I started really getting into it. So, yeah, trying to emulate that whole Jimi Hendrix thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and how... He is complete genius of, you know, just control, just, just this whole feedback thing alone, mm -hmm. you know, making notes out of noise, mm -hmm. you know, just that whole control, controlling chaos yeah. and letting the chaos control you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. taking it to this other place, like yeah. that fearlessness and that openness to capture and help create um, a situation where things can happen with the electronics that are random and powerful and 
adding just all these different kinds of errant colors and things, you know. Mm-hmm. So that was a big influence for, for me trying to get inspiration from him. And then John Hassell as well. Do you know the trumpet player? I don't know him. Mm-hmm. Don't know yeah, him. man. He, he recorded some really amazing records with Brian Eno okay. and okay. Lanois. And he was, for me, he was one of the first people I ever heard put a harmonizer on a trumpet mm-hmm. or just on a horn. Mm-hmm. And it just was sounded so complete and this amazing extension of his natural sound that was so it was just so beautiful and and so natural and, and yeah. just yeah. and really uh had a lot of purpose you know mm-hmm. and uh you know this cat sam gendel today he's doing that okay mm-hmm. or gendel i don't know how you pronounce his last name but g-e-n-d-e-l i think he just made a record with uh blake mills and pino uh, paladino yeah yeah mm-hmm. so but he's doing that kind of just you know amazing control of of harmonizer and making it fit into music where the harmony is changing and everything mm-hmm. like he's a real he's really an expert at that it's really beautiful sound so but back in the 80s you know yeah john has said that was something that was interesting to me like wow you know you know and eddie harris too you know he had the thing but much less so right i was more into his compositions and his playing oh yeah oh yeah and and then his nastiness and uniqueness on the microphone (laughs) like him and jimmy smith man they're (laughs) they're coming from that that same school of just yeah. like they're like comedians. That's true. You know, they're entertainers. Yep. That's on the true. mic. You know, and a lot of people don't understand that today. Is like those guys were working in the clubs, you know, six nights a week. You know, they gotta they have to they have to keep they have to keep the show going. And sometimes, you know, it's not just playing music. That's right. You know, they're like they're MCs as well they're their own MCs. So they're talking, they're telling stories, they're augmenting the instrumental music with, with all of that, the stories and jokes and, you know, like just calling people out the audience or whatever, you know, they're, they're trying to keep people engaged so that the music connects stronger. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole, that's a whole nother aspect of that culture, you know, and like, Dizzy Gillespie was, you know, he's so funny too. I mean, that was, you know, I don't really hear people talking about that aspect of the music that much, you know, of the, that whole tradition, you know, of like um, jazz musicians in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, how they were engaging with the audience right, when right. they weren't playing their instruments. It's very, it's a very interesting Thing, man, I've seen Jimmy Smith. Uh-huh. <laughs> some some of the most nasty, sure, <laughs> nasty shit I've ever heard a human being like straight nasty in a like really formal fancy jazz club. Mm-hmm. Just like, yep. You know, <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, man. Oh my god! And then they, also can't. they're trying to gauge the room too. They mm. they'll say I remember Jimmy Smith one time was like he would play some just like real basic kind of blues things like. And people were, you know, clapping. So, oh, is that what you want? You, you just, oh, you do, you guys like, oh, okay, you guys like blue, you know, you know, he's trying to feel it out and see if he could do harmony or something deeper or he, if he had to keep it simple that night, you know, yeah. he's trying to gauge the audience. So doing that through humor and, and verbally engaging the audience is just, man, there, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of lessons there, you know, that's the truth. That's the truth. Charlie gets that man, Charlie yeah, Hunter. Yeah, yeah. He, he knows he's very connected uh, to the audience and the whole process of that. You know, that's mm-hmm. and that makes it fun playing live with him because he's he's gonna always serve that need. Mm-hmm. You know, and always he's always plugged in and you know and che- and trying to play the room. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I missed that. That's a fun part of music for me. 
yeah, hey man, that's that that was one reason um, that I was drawn to you guys because again, man, first getting around, seeing all the deep cats that were out, it was great. This is what can be done. That's amazing. But having that communal aspect, like you were saying, trying to connect on more than one level to the audience to keep them engaged. Um, I just, I feel like generationally, I missed a lot of that, but I connected with that aspect with you guys, man. It wasn't just badass musicianship. I mean, you guys were, were, were having fun, you know, and, and stretching yeah. out, you know, and, and, and it really, um, it really translates live and in the records too. Um, d- did you guys meet at Jazz Fest in New Orleans? I'm speaking of Garage Artois now. Where did you guys first, first hang? What, how did that get together? Uh, well, we, we met the three of us, Stanton Moore and Charlie Hunter and I, we met at the, the, at the studio to record Stanton's first solo record, All Cooped Out. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I had met Charlie briefly before that at a show somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. and I had met Stanton before that too, at like a galactic show or something like that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, um, you know, Dan Prothero, that producer, he, he kind of helped introduce um, me to Stanton. So always thankful for that. Um, He's the guy that produced the that first record, the okay. All Cooked Out. And we did the Mystery Funk. Right. Uh, that was the first thing that was called Garage of Toi. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was kind of the first time. And then we started playing. And someone just sent me a CD a while ago, too. Of, we did this gig at the Dream Palace. And what was that, 98 or something? It's on fire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We need to do something with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of fire then. Yeah. Charlie was standing up playing then. See, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't semi-retired in the chair. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. But I mean, it's it's really cool, man. Again, just you know, from the outside looking in, to be able to introduce, you know, a completely different subset of music listeners to, you know, you guys played everything from Ornette Coleman to Hendrix to, you know, you name it, along with your original compositions. And that's, that's really a part of my mission. You know, I, I, I the jazz crowd it, it is cool and it can be not so cool as we both know, but to, to get it to, to people who've never heard this music in a place that is, let's say, um, less judgmental <laughs> is really hip. To, to, to be a part of, of that scene, man. Um, and God, man, you must be in, in, in 20 bands. Like, like this whole break, did you, did you need a break? I know you miss, you know, playing actively for people, but <laughs> this, this, this pandemic is complicated, man. Are, are, you, are you enjoying the rest or are you just like, later for that, man, it's time to get to work? I mean, the first, the first month or two was, was fun because you know I got to really spend a lot of time with my girlfriend and it and it, it just it was the first time that it really felt like oh yeah there there's no one is expecting anything from me hmm. it was the first time in a long time that I had truly relaxed and just like I don't have to do anything today and no one's waiting for me to do anything or to deliver something, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was really a peaceful, a really great break, you know? But man, you know, I need to be playing seven nights a week. Sure. You know, for many reasons, you know? Um, You know, that was a big reason. You know, I used to be in in several bands with Mike Dillon, the percussionist. And it was like, well, we're in this van, we're driving every day because this is the only way to play seven nights a week, six nights a week. Because the the tradition of clubs having, you know, a six month long residency, mm-hmm. you're doing two shows, three shows a day, six or seven nights a week, that n- no longer existed. Right. So, you know, we had to travel to get that in, you know, because 
we're our you know our priorities to get better on our instruments and to learn more so you, our chops need that and you know and also you know we're out there minimum wage, minimum wage workers <laughs> we're just trying to break even so um that's kind of a kind of a thing but you know fans have been super generous during this time off you know super generous donating for the live streams and helping us out on those band camp first fridays yeah and so um you know i'm trying to just stay creative and play as much in my studio i mean i'm lucky i've got this garage here yeah. you know behind me and that I can do stuff in. I mean, it'd be, you know, it's tough for, my daughter has been in Brooklyn all year mm -hmm. and she's 21 and she, you know, the parks were closed. They don't have a rooftop. They don't have a balcony. The street, there was a lot of people in the streets. So, you know, it was really hard for them. They weren't getting out and it's just, yeah. it's not, not a great place to be during a pandemic. So, mm -hmm um it's really a different experience for everyone you know yeah i think it's great for charlie though because he doesn't like you know he don't like being on the road so he's he's how he loves it man yeah you know he's he's got his new place in greensboro and he's right. oh right. man he loves it he's just in there making his videos every day you know some people yeah. just really thriving you mm -hmm. know mm-hmm you know, it's like uh, my girlfriend's 13 year old son, you know, he didn't like going to school. Mm -hmm. He's an incredible student, uh, extremely smart. And he's in these, all these AP classes. Nice. So he loves being at home and just doing the computer classes. You know, he gets tired of the computer sometimes, but yeah, you know, he's happy not going to school. So yeah, it's so different for everyone. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Man, I think about um, the motors turning as we get, you know, back to work. Um, and two things that you just pointed out there, um, you know, Charlie Hunter being now in, you know, the Greensboro, North Carolina community, you know, you're in Seattle. Um, how much do, how much significance do the local scenes take on now that, you know, we're getting, you know, back to work? Is it, is it going to go back to just touring is the main thing. You gotta be on the road to make money or is there a situation now where like local towns are taking on more significance as far as, you know, providing work for musicians? What are your thoughts on that, man? Well, we'll see, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the venues, you know, they now have the, um, this huge federal uh, bailout program and so they're going to get some money um, I just got back from New Orleans mm -hmm. um, and I'll stand down there with Stanton Moore and I played my first gig that I've played since March 12, 2020 mm. so I played at an outdoor movie theater the Broad or Broadside and the owner of the indoor club, he bought the parking lot next door. Okay. And so he built this big movie screen and he's just a big open parking lot with a fence all around it. And you just go in there and all the chairs are there. They're set up socially distant um, mm -hmm. people from each other. And man, we had a great crowd and I had a great gig. I was playing with Helen Gillet and Pedro Segundo. Yeah. And man, just imp improvised gig and it was so fun and just, wow, you know, the people came out were super supportive and listening and, you know, it was a great feeling, but, you know, that's a, that's a rare kind of outdoor club. Now I know that Denver mm -hmm. has been doing a lot of shows. I okay. know some people have been doing little tours on the East coast, but We'll see what happens in Seattle. I've just been going to the Royal Room and doing uh, live streams once in a while, mm -hmm. but no, no public gigs. But you know they're going to start happening. Sure, sure. You know, people like I just got my second dose, and 
um summer's coming yeah spring, summer you know like you know there's going to be outdoor gigs it's just you can't stop it you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so i just hope that there's a, a little bit of a course correction financially and unfortunately since the clubs are not going to get the alcohol distributors to help pay for musicians that just that just never seems to work <laughs> you mm -hmm. know like egrams and these giant companies yeah. that they could afford to subsidize i think musicians pay I, there's probably something there but you know the clubs they're trying to they're busy enough just trying to survive on their own right so they can't really be full-time advocates for us and we don't have a real powerful centralized union like we used to so we're kind of on our own so it's probably going to end up going to the people you know you're going to see twenty dollar twenty five dollar covers you know as a minimum to see music but you know look what's you know look what's going on people are paying five seven dollars for a coffee they go out to dinner they're eating some fancy food that's like 150 dollars a person or something you know people are paying 15 dollars for a cocktail you know i mean our the musicians nightly wage it has not gone up since like 1978 you know you're looking at 75 to 100 dollars a night that's been going on since the late 70s early 80s I mean, that's crazy yeah I was just talking to a friend of mine in New Orleans about that. He goes, yeah, man, in 1977, I was making $60 a night, $60, $80 a night, and gas was still under a dollar a gallon or wow. like just broke a dollar a gallon. So <laughs> everything else goes up around us, yeah. but, you know, the pay stays the same. You, you can't do that. You just can't keep doing that. Right. That's right. So, um you know, uh, we'll see what happens, but you know, if whatever it takes to play, you know, I want to get in the van with a bunch of 20 year old kids that are on fires, punk rock or something, you know, like just go, go, go and play all ages venues and play outdoor venues or whatever, you know, whatever's safe and is, is, you know, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fired up, man. I want to go do it. So, um, but I got a gig in um, Miami. Okay. Coming up uh, with John Medeski and Stanton Moore in May. Yeah. And another private gig down near there. So maybe California in July, you know, with Scott Amendola and Will Blades and oh, Jack nice. Parker mm -hmm. and Cyril Batista. So, you know, I hope those things happen. You know, we got that new Nels Klein record that came out uh, a few months ago. So I hope he does some gigs to support that. Yeah. Release. That band is insane. If that band, see, we if this thing wasn't here, you know, we would have, that band would have been doing stuff and we'd be talking about that. I mean, <laughs> right wow. Now. You know, there's so many things that got canceled last year that was just like, oh no, just yeah. creatively. Yeah. It would have been great to have happen. Yeah, man. That's wild. Yeah, it's it's gonna be interesting to see how it um, how it unfolds, man. Um, I guess yeah, we, very curious, you know. But um, I, I guess we we got the calm down cologne. But for you, um, what are you planning under your own name next, recording wise? I know you've got some stuff in the can. What do you what are you thinking might be your next uh, your next step? Um, well, yeah, we got the calm down cologne. Mm -hmm. That new record just came out on Royal Potato Family Records. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Nels Klein record, Share the Wealth on Blue Note. But mm -hmm. that came out in November or December. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, I've been working on my Bandcamp page, trying to create new stuff for release um, on those first Fridays of every month. Yeah. You know, I'm always recording stuff here. Um, the new Coo Eek record just came out k-h-u-e-e-x it's uh some tlingit uh friends of mine in seattle that mm -hmm. uh bernie warrell uh was playing with us when mm -hmm. he, he wow got. wow we made yeah we made uh five records with him oh my oh my so that was 
incredible experience so fun with bernie yeah. miss him love him mm -hmm. so uh we're going to be in the studio next month in my studio actually right here finishing that record uh, one of those records a new kui record mm -hmm. uh so yeah a lot of little things coming up you know scaric band yeah all kinds, all kinds of stuff absolutely man sound absolutely. cypher record is done just need titles and artwork. Yeah. So hopefully that'll be out before the end of the year. That's Tim Alexander from Prime, a drummer from Primus, and Tim Mason, the amazing modular synth um, guy and bass player, and I and myself. Yeah. Very yeah. fun. Man, uh, your your organization is off the chain, man. I don't think I could keep up with that much. That's amazing. Yeah, I forget a lot, a lot of things, man. I love these phones. <laughs> You know, you write everything down. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. That's wild. That's wild. Well, man, yeah. I'll get you to hang on just for a second, man. But it, it's been my pleasure talking to you, man. Thanks for thanks for taking time, bro. I really appreciate it. All right, Greg, it. anytime, man. Thank you. Right on. Tell right Dar hello. I will. I will. <laughs>